Uh, women leaning in a different perspective or a different point of view. The title for today is that this is one of those um, few but really interesting instances in the Hebrew Bible in which we have a narrative prose telling the story and then an epic poem that tells the story a little bit differently. The two classic examples are what we have today and the other one is the Song of the Sea, Moses and afterwards Miriam. Um, uh, and this parting of the Red Sea, which first comes in a narr narrative prose, and then it's written in an epic poem afterwards. There are a few other cases of that, um, far more complex and actually far more interesting, I would say, are the reenactments or the, the rephrasing, um, the repeating or earlier, earlier telling of the tales of the Israelites in the desert for 40 years. Um, now somebody's making a lot of noise, please. If you're not speaking, just put just put your put on mute. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and that would be the 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 wanderings in the desert, which were reflected in the Book of Psalms. Again, there's a narrative narrative prose in the Torah, and then afterwards in afterwards, as far as the chronological book or the order of the books as they appear in the canon, uh, we find a different version of sometimes the same story the same tale. Um, now, when, using the words afterwards, of course, is problematic because as you probably know, biblical poetry is thought to be uh, some of the oldest of the texts in, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, which the editing spans over, you know, at least a, probably a thousand years from the earliest to the latest of the editions. And um, and, and we see that we see that not only in the, the difference in the way the story is told, but also in the format or the the, the poetic format, but also the, the language itself. The language is an antiquated language. And I think we know that from everybody knows that from English as well. Just think Shakespeare versus um, other forms of literature, even from the same time. Okay, so why don't we uh, why don't we begin and try to keep in mind? I, I actually I had meant to say that it's good to have the last week's text nearby to consult it. If not, we'll we'll think of it. But um, uh, we won't be meeting next Thursday. I'll be um, in transit at this time, still uh, flying to Israel. If all goes well, but we'll meet the following Thursday. And um, I'll be sending a sheet of uh, rabbinic early and late rabbinic and some also not rabbinic interpretation of where, of different elements of this story. And it's good to have those other, these other, the sheets from today and the sheets from last week uh, in hand so that you can compare. Um, all right, so uh, let's, let's begin. Uh, go ahead, uh, John, why don't you start us off with the first verse? On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang. Okay, so I, I don't think you were with us last week, but I'm guessing you read the story again beforehand. And you know that, uh, that Barak is ostensibly the, the military leader. Uh, Devorah is a prophetess, um, and she's a judge in the true sense, or in the sense of the word that we would use now, adjudicating as uh, dispensing law, legal decisions. Um, but it's really she who's behind, she's, she's the main power, right? And so many people, many people don't re read this verse as v'tashar dvora bayamahulemor, and that day Deborah sang, without Barak son of Avinoam. And the reason for that is because the first word v'tashar, she sang, is in singular, it's in feminine singular. And it, it, it's not plural, so it doesn't really include. So many people actually amend the text to, to say that, that this is really the song of Devorah. I then you ask, well, why would somebody change it afterwards? Because as we say in Yiddish, it's pasnished, right? It's not right for the woman to have all the glory, even though that's what this story is about. This story, as we saw, is about two women, Devorah and Yael, having all the glory for winning the war, as opposed to Barak, who should have been doing it, I guess. That's the... The, the the criticism okay so um 
any comments before we go on? John, I'll ask you to read another section since that was so small, although you disappeared. There you go. Uh, does anybody have anything else to say on this verse? Uh, just a quick question. Sure. Um, is Avi Noam, my father is Noam? Is that the meaning? Yeah, yeah, it, it's probably probably Theophoric as well. My father, the God, my father, Avinu, kind of, you know, Asheva Shemayim, my father in heaven kind of a thing, is Noam is pleasant. Oh, okay. Um, right, the, like the name Noomi, uh, Ruth's uh, mother-in-law, she's pleasant. Okay. All right, go ahead, John. Why don't you read another section? When locks go untrimmed in Israel... When people dedicate themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings. Give ear, O rulers. I will sing, will sing to the Lord, will hymn the Lord, the God of Israel. O Lord, when you came forth from Seir, advanced from the country of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dripped, yea, the clouds dripped water, the mountains quaked. Before the Lord, him of Sinai, before the Lord, God of Israel. Okay, so the language, we, you can see it's poetic, right? It's, uh, yeah, there is the, a lot of parallelism, perhaps the easiest parallelism to those that still are not clear about that term. On the third line, O Lord, when you came forth from Seir, came forth, talking about God, from Seir, another way of saying it, from the country, Edom, Seir and Edom are different names for Esav, uh, the, those who are descended from, from uh, uh, Jacob's brother, Esau. And um, so two different names for the same people, that's a classic parallelism, right? Uh, saying the same thing in two different words. Um, sometimes it's kind of a stair, what they call a staircase parallelism. Um, the, uh, the earth trembled, the heavens dripped, they're not uh, synonyms, but they're they're similar to the thing. Something was happening, and then the mountains quaked. Um, what's another example here? Uh, yeah, give ear is parallel to will sing. Right now, um, the what's easy in this particular. Uh, um, well, the, what I what what I want to point out first is this idea that. The people, we'll get to the first, the first sentence is very unclear, and I'll tell you why in a second. But the people themselves, they are, they're, they're commanded to Baruchu Adonai, right? We know from the prayer Baruchu et Adonai Hamvorach, um, that they shall bless or they shall praise is a better translation. Um, they, I would say instead of bless the Lord, praise the Lord might be better. Um, and then we're going to have that term is going to be repeated in a few more verses, which is going to form what we call an inclusio, which we had last week, uh, two weeks ago with the psilim, those carven images. Um, but the first problem here, or the, the greatest problem here is what does it mean bifroa praot b'Israel? Um, praot, those that know modern Hebrew know that those are right, means today in modern Hebrew riots. It means unruly behavior, it means chaos. Uh, but it also means hair, which is not wrapped up. Bifro is to un, is when uh, is uh, you know is to let your hair down, kind of a thing, and hence you've got this this uh, this sentence th this translation here, and the translations of this you'll kind of go in two different directions. One is when the locks go in for, in other words, people let their hair grow, and that that might be seen as a bad thing, and it might be seen as a good thing. How could it be seen as a good thing? Those that, that study the Torah teachings as well? Why would that be seen as a good thing when the Israelites let their hair grow? Someone? Uh, like, like a Nazarite or- uh... Exactly, right. They should, they're dedicate, that word dedicate. They're, they're, it, it, and Hitnadev is, 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 is uh, um, we use it today as volunteer, is uh, more in the term of volunteer, but here it's, dedicate whatever to, it's a free choice dedication so that that's how some people see it that that's a good time when the israelites are being pious but others see in this when there's no king just things are there's chaos the, the enemies can do whatever they want right so um so that's in contradistinction to the latter part of the of the of, of the verse that says of that line that says 
but they, they, you know, they'll dedicate themselves and they'll bless the Lord um, because there needs to be, something is going on here. This is the introduction to this song. We don't know yet um, what's going to happen. Um, the other way to go about this is that, um, is that there, the thing, there's a mess, there's a chaotic mess and, um, and it has nothing to do with hair. So you'll find both of those things in, trans, in translations, various translations, you'll find both those things in commentaries as well. Okay, um, if it, go ahead. Yeah, if it's parallel, then the first makes more sense. It, you, you mean the, uh, the Nazarite if, if, idea? If the two parts of the first line uh, are a uh, parallel verse, then the good thing makes more sense. Right. So the and that's why these translators went with that. But you know, uh, the big biblical parallelism is not an exact science. Um, very often, in fact, they have a term, and I don't know whether it's used. In, I don't think it's it, it's used in English. Opposite parallelism, but in Hebrew, and some of our professors made fun of that because it, that's then it's not parallelism if it's tikbolet hafucha. It, but very, it's called something else. I'm sure. But the the A of the verse says one thing, and the B says the opposite. Not the other end of it, like earth and heaven. That's not that's not exactly opposite, but you know, dark and light, that kind of a thing. And so that might be the answer. That, that you have, we have to be really careful. And it's interesting because when people started to keep track of the laws of biblical uh, poetics and, and and biblical poetry um, in the 19th century, many of the commentaries they uh, they, they they got carried away. So if you, you know, somebody comes up with the law of parallelism, oh, well, then this text must be corrupt if it's not parallel, that kind of thing. Yeah? In other words, you're putting the, the cart before the horse, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Yes, John. Uh, one of the Hebrew references I found was um, translated, the bonds were loosed. Right. And I assume that goes to what you were saying. If you don't have leadership, if you don't have a king or whatever, you've got less control over, over you. Right, and I'm I, I, I'm influenced, but in that, and that that seems to make some sense to me because that's what it seems the whole book of Judges is about. Mm -hmm. It's about this, and we're going to see at the in this poem. There's criticism of those tribes that did not participate in this war, so there's no binding thing. There's not that everybody, but it, it, we're going to come up empty with a lot of things in this poem. There's a lot of things that we just don't know. Um, emendations um, fly freely amongst different commentators and and translators here. Um, I'll just give you a few that maybe make sense on the way, but uh, we just have to say we, we're doing the best we can. We don't know because we don't know poetic language as much as we do say narrative language because the text, we can't assume it's been it's been passed down in a trustworthy manner from the time it was written especially since this text is really old and it had a law it had a, a history of oral of it being only oral okay all right so um but we do have god positioned here uh, god is is put into this into the story right away yeah uh, and there's a hint at that god will be fighting for the people this is god's war and god's fighting for the people through nature, through, it seems like there's a storm brewing here, yet the clouds dripped with water, heavens dripped, the clouds dripped with water, the mountains quaked. It, it kind of leads us to believe that we're talking about a, a huge thunderstorm here. Okay, and that makes sense for the rest of the story as well. Although, let's see, let's see what happens. All right, then. Um, uh, Jackie, do you want to read the six to seven? No, you actually were unmuted. Jackie, you were unmuted, then you muted yourself. Please go ahead. Now. In the days of Shagmar, son of Anat, in the days of Yael, caravans ceased, and wayfarers went by roundabout paths. Deliverance ceased, ceased in Israel. Till you arose, O Deborah, arose, O mother in Israel. Okay, so as we slowly put the pieces together, um, we'll talk about the, just the middle thing right now. And, and wayfarers went by roundabout paths because things were wild. It was uncontrolled. 
that kind of supports that, that understanding. You see how that works, Dan? Right? So if you look in that verse itself parallel, but here this, it seems like that, that might inform our, our understanding. Deliverance ceased. It ceased in Israel. Okay. What's interesting here is not so much that until you arose, everything was a mess, Devor, until you came along. And that's lovely. That's wonderful. But, but um, it, 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 it brings to two other women involved, right? One is not Shamgar, who was barely mentioned as a, as a judge, but he's the son of his mother, Anat, which is a female name. So there's a woman thrown in there, right? That's why this is all called women leaning in. A woman is thrown in by, you know, around by the way. Um, and then in the days of Yael, caravans ceased. Now, when somebody says, a poet says, in the days of Yael, you can rest assured that everybody who's listening and reading that poem, they know who Yael is. Okay. Now we, if we only had this poem and we were reading it and we had it, we didn't have the narrative description of the last chapter, we'd say, who the hell is now is, you know, who, who are these people? Who is Yael? Um, but we're going to have a lot more about Yael in this poem and more than you even bargained for, I'm going to say. Um, okay. Please, anybody, if you want to say something or, or a different understanding, interpretation, uh, we'll have time to relate this to our own lives afterwards, but uh, just chime in. Okay, Alan, why don't you read eight to nine? Okay, I can't see your mouth, Alan, so I don't know if your mouth is moving, but I, we do need you to unmute. Sorry. Okay. Um, was there a fighter then in the gates? No, no, we're, we're, we're at eight, eight to nine. Oh, you have perhaps you have a different translation. Are, are, are you reading from a different translation? I'm reading from uh, Judges of the Tanakh. Right, and you're reading from, from chapter five, verses eight to nine? Wrong page. All right, here we go. Sorry, Rabbi, I, I can't see it. Uh, I thought eight. When, when, when they chose new gods. When they chose new gods, was there a fighter then in the gates? No shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. One more. They, my heart is with Israel's leaders, with the dedicated of the people, bless the Lord. Okay, sorry, you, you'd, read for, I, I, you'd read from the middle of the verse, that's why. I, I, you. So um, again, this is, this is the, this leads me to believe that when locks go untrimmed is not a great translation here. That is when thing, when their chaos is reigning is they, they, they chose new gods. So there's nobody to fight. If they chose new gods, we all know from, from the, uh, well, the way that it's, all these stories are presented by the Deuteronomic uh, editor. We know that there's no, there's no fighter in the gates when they've chosen new gods. Um, and, and that's expressed in different, different ways. There's no fighter in the gates, there's no shield or spear to be seen. Uh, and yet on the other hand, um, God's heart or the, the, the poets, maybe it's, it, it's Devorah's heart is with the leaders of Israel, and then the repetition of that term, um, bless the Lord, right? And the, the same word as well, hamit nadvim, dedicated. So you've got dedicated of the people, bless the Lord, and that reflects the first verse that we had, right? When locks go and trim, whatever that means in Israel, when people dedicate themselves, bless the Lord. So that's it. that forms an inclusio. That means it's a literary unit unto its own. It's part of the larger poem. But it sets the stage for what's about to go on, which is the bottom line is there's a mess. There needs to be, uh, there's been some wavering of the faith of the people. That seems to be clear there. Uh, but yet God is poised to help out. But it's almost like they just need the right person to whip them into shape, you know, to get them back into discipline. And although there's nothing here about um, details, uh, it, your, your, your purpose, it, says the poet, Oh, Israel is to bless God, is to praise God. Okay. Um, 
So an interesting understanding, let's just jump perhaps to modern day in our own feeling. When we say Baruch Hu Adonai Amvorach, uh, for John and others here, for, for who, who may not be familiar with the Hebrew prayer book, um, that's the call to prayer, uh, both morning and evening services. When you have a, a quorum of people, the prayer leader will go Baruch Hu Adonai Amvorach, Baruch ha, and, and then the others will, at, will respond Baruch Adonai Amvorach, the Olam Va'ed, um, and that's, that's not part of the blessings before the, the recitation of Shema. That's a call to public prayer. And here the call is used to, um, to set the stage for God getting involved in the war of God's people. That's, that's in, and, it, and it's, in other words, there's a, a, a reciprocal or there's, a, there's an organic relationship between those who who continue to pray to God, to bless God, or to praise God, and God being involved in their in their events. Okay, not not so clear. I understand. I hearing myself. I thought I had it better idea before I said it out loud. I should probably try doing some speaking some of these things in the mirror to see how they sound before I share them with you. I thought I, but so it doesn't sound as good now as it did when in my head when I was preparing. Any comments about that or Baruch or call to prayer or that would have some bearing on this text. Okay, I, then. Yes. I'm, I'm actually a little confused. So, so in eight through nine, we're talking about when they chose new gods, and so there were no fighters in the gates because God wasn't on their side, I take it. Correct. And, and then my heart is with Israel, Israel's leaders with the dedicated of the people so is that separating the leaders and the dedicated are separated from the ones who chose new gods yes that, that's very much a possibility the other way to understand is that there's a covenant and although the people of israel have not kept up kept up their side of the bargain um god is keeping up god's side of the bargain so both of those are but but your your the lack of clarity is is absolutely uh natural Trudy because these texts are not they're they're poetic texts they're in the air that's even if we did understand all the language all the time and even if we could say that we have received the text the way it was originally meant to be um, it's still poetry is something that is is contextual right and it's really hard to understand poetry from another time in another place isn't it so with that without a commentary look at we can't we don't even understand rock songs from the 60s and 70s right <laughs> what you know heart of gold what the hell is a heart of gold what does he mean <laughs> okay. all right that's why we have alan alan is our key to understanding <laughs> historical context okay and um and and speaking speaking of historians and historical context scotty would you read 10 to 11 please You riders on tawdy she asses, you sit on saddle rugs and you wayfarers declare it. Louder than the sound of archers, there among the watering places, let them chant the gracious acts of the Lord, his gracious deliverance of Israel. Then did the people of the Lord march down to the gates. Okay, so we shouldn't be looking for chronological order here of how things happen, other than this is kind of the background has been set People, it's chaotic. Get your get your act together. Um, God is committed to this. There are those who dedicate themselves, uh, those who do bless God. And now, um, kind of look, now comes the the, the crit this biting criticism that this poet loves to use here, right? All those of you who are riding your Cadillacs and kicking back on your velvet couches in, in Palm Springs, um, you too need to wake up, right? Uh, one of the, just a few elements that are thrown in here that help us in the future, the sound of archers, right? You can, I, I'm guessing the, the, uh, the, the whoosh of the, of the arrows in the air, um, those who are at watering places, uh, what's going on there? I think, I think it seems to be a hint. It's a natural thing to say in a story. Those, that's where you gather to talk about things, not only for, for people to get married, and to date on their first date, as we've seen in many stories, but it's also where people, that's where the, that's where communication happens at the watering holes. But I think that there is a, um, there, this is a, a, a bit of foreshadowing 
about water in the story, the archers, the water, and, um, and then calling the people. This is a poem about, that describe is not a poem in order to call people to go to war. It's a poem that talks about when the people have been called to come to war, what happens, right? Who goes and who doesn't go, okay? And now we get to our beloved Devorah, which, which of course seems a little bit strange to me that the woman singing the song or the woman who composed the song writes about herself in third person this way, but I don't think it's that, that strange. And certainly it could also be that this was the poem uh, that was in literature and then only afterwards was that title and Dvora sang this particular poem. So, um, so Trudy, why don't you read for us uh, about Devora? The first lines about Devora, 12 to 13. Awake, awake, O Devora. Awake, awake, strike up the chant. Arise, O Barak, take your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then was the remnant made victor over the mighty. The Lord's people won my victory over the warriors. Okay, so that's uh, the, that's the, there was no details about the war here yet. It's just that it's still kind of part of the first, it's still part of the first part of this, of this, uh, of this poem. And um, this idea of uh, Uri Uri, which, you know, we have in a number of prophecies in Isaiah and in Psalms as well, you know, um, wake up, get up, um, stand up for your rights. Okay, so, uh, so we have Devora, and it, it seems to be more attention is applied on Devora here as there is on Barak, um, although I don't want to push that too much. Yeah, so this is the, because Barak is here and, and paralleled to Dvorah in some ways, Uri and Kum are parallel. Um, that's why many people would say there's no reason to amend the first verse. And it really is Dvorah and Barak are singing the song. So then why they say, then you ask them, the why does it say in the, in the first, in the second person, uh, second person singular and not third person singular and not plural that first word of, of the first verse, and they'll say, because she was more important. Or, you know, uh, I think uh, Radak says, um, Radak, I think it's Rabbi David Kimke says, she's more important. And one of maybe him or somebody else in the medieval uh, commentator says, because she wrote it, but they both sang it. So it's kind of like the Beatles, you know, Lennon wrote it, but Paul, uh, Paul and John wrote, sang it together. Okay. All right, now we start to get to uh, allow, any anybody questions or comments? Okay, so now we get to a little bit of geography. We get to some geography here, and uh, and so uh, Harold, I'm going to let you do this as our resident uh, Israeli archaeologist geographer. Okay. From Ephraim came they whose roots are in Amalek. After you, your kin Benjamin. From Mahir came down leaders, from Zebulon such as hold the martial staff, and Issachar's chiefs were with Deborah. As Barak, so was Issachar, rushing after him into the valley. Among the clans of Ru Reuben were great decisions of heart. Why then did you stay among the sheepfolds and listen as they piped for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben were great searchings of heart. Gilead uh, tarried beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained at the seacoast and tarried at his landings. Zebulon is a people that mocked at death. Naphtali on the open heights. Okay, so uh, any comments before I go? What, what, what do these names, names mean to you? Let me, uh, let's start by that. One thing that what well, first of all, what do before the questions? What do people? What, what do people see? What does it mean? To what do the names mean? What were you about to say, Harold? Oh, um, well, the names are all of the tribes of um, Israel. Uh, all of them? No, 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 not all of them. The, the, the tribe of Judah is the tribe of Judah is not there. Correct, and and who else often comes along with Judah? 
Well, your well, Benjamin is there. Um, Benjamin was. It, it's Shimon. Shimon, remember on the map of Israel, the yeah. map of the tribes, Simon is in, in, enclosed, is landlocked by uh, by Judah. And, um, and so they often come together and they're left out of this. So this is a story from the north or it's hard, hard to say. It, it doesn't sound like there's criticism of Judah and Simon here. It just means that the, it sounds like they're not existence. They're not, in, they're not on the radar of this poet because the 10 other tribes are represented. Now you might say you're missing Joseph, but I think you all know that Ephraim and Menashe are, are instead of Joseph. You're gonna now quickly look to see well, you can see Ephraim, but where do you find Menashe? Does anybody know where we find Menashe here? Is that Gilead? No, I no. We'll talk about Gilad, Gilad, Gilead in just a second. Why it's there? Why, why even though it's not the name? Is it Machir? Yes, Machir is the son of Menashe. Okay. Interesting. Interesting how you write. So, uh, tribal names stayed the same in many, many different poetic uh, passages throughout the Hebrew Bible, but in this particular one, Menashe was replaced by Menashe's son. We don't know why, we don't know, you know, whatever it is, just an interesting kind of a thing. Now, Sid asked about Gilad or Gilead right away. And um, so Gilad is, is an area, is a region more than a people, at least in this context. And uh, it, what it reflects here is that, do you remember the story, Sid and others, when they're about to go into the land and then, um, uh, Menashe, or half of the tribe of Menashe, and um, and um, Ruvain. Um, they said it's two and a half tribes. Ruvain, half of Menashe. I don't, do, can you get the the map up easily, Madeline, if you're with us? Um, God. Two and a half tribes. Uh, it was God. Oh, they stayed on the other side. Right. You see? Of, of, can you see this now? Right, so it's yes. Ruvain, God, and half of Menashe. So, and, and there's Gilead. Right, see, Ramot Gilad. So this area is called Ramot. Gilad. So, or, or it, 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 at least this part uh, of Menashe. And, and, and the, so Ruvain they, and Gilad, they, tarry, they, they didn't move quickly, right? They, 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 yeah. they didn't move at all, actually. They stayed. They didn't get involved. So... Um, what it's what it's saying is that Ephraim, and we'll get to the Amalek in a second. Ephraim and Menashe, and at least part of uh, uh, Benjamin, and at least part of Menashe, and Yisachar, and um, Yisachar. one more. There's Where one more. Yisachar. Six came and six didn't. There's Yisachar right here. So, in any case, we're talking about you know these. The expectation was these tribes would get involved in this, in the, the central tribes where you see the red and the purple and the orange, that they would get involved. That's their area. But then the, the poem is saying, um, but the Donites, they hung out, they lingered by their ships. And since we don't have any evidence that Don actually had ships, uh, it was suggested already in the 50s, I think, 60s, that perhaps 50s or maybe earlier that they hired themselves out to the Tzidonim, that is from the northern, the, the seafaring people, they hired themselves out as sailors. Um, but Asher and Zvulun, um, who you can see is the purple, Asher is the green at the top, um, they stayed, yeah. Asher stayed on the seacoast, seacoast as if they were tied to the, they, they couldn't leave because they were tied. And, um, and the Zebulonites, they, they just didn't care and they should have been involved, but they didn't care. Uh, and Naphtali, they were on the high plains. Uh, many of them stayed, even though that's their area. Uh, so what this poem is saying, this paragraph is saying, is that there are half the tribes uh, listened to the call, and half of them didn't. Um, let's see if we can get rid. We can get rid of the the map right now, please. Thanks. Uh, is is, is Mount is the is Mount uh, near? Uh, what was that up there near? Their Menasha is what? Uh, uh, the map disappeared. That's oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. I so, was just wondering if Mount Hermon 
was that's north of uh Machir is not on the map. Machir is part of is, is the son of Menashe, that's all we can say. But yeah, the, okay, the, yeah. yeah, okay. Now okay. the idea the idea that's coming across is that half of the tribes listen they they heeded the call to arms and half of them didn't. Um, the one of the most problematic phrases here is though is is the first from Ephraim came they whose roots are in Amalek. What does Amalek have to do with this, right? Um, you remember yeah. Amalek is, is not so so one way of understanding it is that is that that's where that was the place where the Amalek Amalekite people first were. That was their original homelands where Ephraim was was sitting at that particular point. Oh. Um, and um, or or it could very well be uh, it, the text is corrupt here. So many of the commentators uh, suggest to amend the text here that would reflect sare 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 be amim. Uh, no, we had that. Um, yeah, um, sarim be amim or sare amim, something like the the generals of the of the nations, right? Ephraim came up from the generals of the nations, the leaders of the nations, something like that. But the truth of the matter is that we, we just don't know. It's just a strange kind of a thing. Um, right. Okay. Okay. So uh, I think that's John it. John was not involved at all. Who? God. God. Um, was it? Uh, never mind. I, I, I the tribe God? Yes. You're right. God they, is missing they, here as well. Why did I think God is involved at all? Yeah, God is left out. Yeah, that I, I actually didn't know. For some reason, I thought it was six and six. Okay. okay. Anyway, we get the overall idea, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, according, to, according to the ancient Aramaic translation here, uh, the Targum Yonatan, um, when it says Ephraim, it means Joshua. It's kind of like a chronological order here. Joshua first was the was the first leader, the military leader, at, and then after Joshua uh, was Saul from Benjamin, right? And and that's why those two are mentioned there. But that's Agadado. That's just legend. And we'll, maybe we'll get to some of that next week. I don't know that that's really relevant for here. Okay. Um, Rabbi. Sure. Is uh, I I take it that when the reference is to Reuben, that there's sarcasm there. And I'm wondering why it was only used against that tribe. Well, it's not it's not just um, there. It, it, they remained at the seacoast and tarried at their at their landings in Asher as well. That's a bit of sarcasm as well. Wow. I, I see they, what you. Yeah. yeah. Or a people they mocked at death, right? They didn't realize that they, their their lives were threatened. They mocked it. So the whole thing is pretty sarcastic, I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, they the the they, they yeah they they sit in their sheepfolds. They listened as they as they played flutes to their their flocks. You know, okay, all right then. Anything else? Okay, this is a tough this is a tough uh, a tough chapter, folks. It'll get easier. All right. So 1922. Um, who who. Dan, you want to read 1922 for us? Okay. Uh, then the kings came. They fought. The kings of Canaan fought at Taanach by Megiddo's waters. They got no spoil of silver. Stars fought from heaven. From their courses, they fought against Sisra. The torrent Kishon swept them away. The raging torrent, the torrent Kishon. March on, my soul, with courage. Then the horse's hoofs pounded as headlong galloped the steeds. Okay, so a lot of uh, colorful impressions from war. Um, the places of Tanakh and Megiddo are up in the north. Some of you have been to those places. There's in Megiddo, in that area, there, is, there are some uh, springs. So that's probably the waters that are, that are Megiddo's waters that are mentioned. Um, and then you've got this, uh, the, so, so it's not just, uh, by the way, you saw Yavin, the king of, the, who was mentioned in the previous chapter is not mentioned here at all, but the multiple kings. Sisra will be mentioned, but right now it's a number of Canaanite kings. They thought they were going to get spoils, but instead they 
they lost out. Not only did they lost out, they lost out in a big way. The, the, they were swept away they were, as if the, the, the chariots and the, and the horses, if we take the knowledge we have from, from the other story, here they are waiting to go to war with them. And then suddenly a storm comes and sweeps them all out to the sea. Kishon flows into the sea. Um, so it's a combination of, uh, um, of, of impressions from, from nature but also from then the horse's hoofs pounded as headlong gallop the steeds, right? There's, there's also uh, th this, I, th th you know, th like, like the, the archer from beforehand. And by the way, the water from beforehand as well. I think there's ways of, of planting the seeds of what's gonna come up and this is what came up in this particular paragraph. But in any case, it's seen as a miracle. And that's the most important part here. This is what this story, this is not, a story of, uh, you know, of good uh, necessarily of military prowess, but it's of a, a miraculous victory because God is on their side, and that's how the poem started, and that's kind of how it's going to end as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like many you religions see, around yeah, the world, when you like... win, when you win, that's God who has won for you, and when you lose, well, I guess we did something wrong, so God punished yeah. us. Yeah. There's, there's really no arguing with that methodology. Okay. <laughs> so now we, we hark back to a part of the poem. Remember what said, Uri, Uri, Devora, right? Wake up, wake up, arise. Um, so there's kind of a play on that Uri with an Ayin. There's this Oru with an Aleph, which I think is intentional. Uh, at the next, that's, that's 23. If Eric, if you could read 23 for us. I don't have the text. Oh, Stu's okay. not here to do it for me, so I just don't want to screw it up. Sure. Okay, that's fine. So, uh, uh, Bill, would you read for us 23? First, Maroz said the angel of the Lord bitterly cursed the in its inhabitants because they came not to the aid of the Lord, to the aid of the Lord among the warriors. Okay. So um, the first question everybody has is who is Meroz? And the best, the best answer to that is we have no idea. Uh, <laughs> what it seems is that <laughs> okay. it seems like Meroz is, is perhaps a, uh, well, again, there's argument between the scholars. And um, this is the curse of when they say, uh, what. Uh, um, is there is there no it's it's a little information is dangerous is there is there an expression that says too much information is dangerous <laughs> uh well you know i've got i think five or six commentaries and uh some are in hebrew some are in english it depends some are in larger print some are in smaller print so depending on my mood my energy level um i i kind of shift so but i do get you, you get one you get one opinion and the opposite really there's so much um especially in this chapter uh, so the commentators divide into two camps. Those that say Meroz is an Israelite city, an important Israelite city that we, have, we haven't heard about in any other place, but that's all right. We don't hear about everything. Uh, that was there and did not come to aid. The others say it was a friendly Canaanite city, that there was a covenant with them and they, and they, they could have come, but they didn't. And I like that commentary better because it goes along with Yael's place uh, role in this story, which we're going to come up to. She's not part of Israel either, right? So it feels like, um, it, as we're going to say, she is compared to, uh, Yael is compared, as you'll see in a second, to this Meroz. So that leads me to believe it wasn't an Israelite, but it was It was a Canaanite city. Okay. A, a friendly Canaanite city. Uh, someone who should have been, should have retain, returned the favor or kept the, 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 the conditions of a of a, uh, will, will you excuse me just a second? I'm dealing with a emergency situation. Apologies. Okay. Um, 
so, but in any case, they're uh, cursed, right? And I, I missed, usually I try to change Adonai Yud Vav Hei into Hei, and for some reason I missed this one and this one. But what's interesting here is that there's an angel of God. Now, remember, an angel of God could be a messenger of God as well. It doesn't necessarily mean to be one of these kind of angels, but it could be just a kind of a person. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's Dvorah, I don't know. Uh, so that's an element that I have no explanation for. I don't think anybody really does. Why of all the things here, this brings, unless of course you want to say the whole thing is miraculous. So if the victory in battle was miraculous, well, here too, the messenger is miraculous. But it's the language of Oru, uh, uh, Oru Arur, Yoshvia, that this, the, this command form of curse them and they will be cursed uh, because they didn't come not to the people's aid, they didn't come to God's aid, right? Because this whole story places in theological framework. So that's on one hand. The Merozites, the Merozites, or the city of Meroz, whoever Meroz might be, they didn't come. On the other hand, We've got the next bit. If you could read Moriah. Most blessed of women, B-I-L, wife of Heber, the Canaanite. Most blessed of women in tents. He asked for water. She offered milk. In a princely bowl, she made him curds. He, her hand left for the tent pin, her right for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera, crushed his head, smashed the, and pierced his temple. At her feet, he sank, lay outstretched. At her feet, he sank, lay still. Where he sank, there he lay, destroyed. Okay, we're going to get to Yael's, the details of a second of what happened, at least what it seems to have happened here. Um, but before that, it, so in contradistinction to Meroz, Yael, and it's emphasized, the wife of Hever, the Kenite, right? So, not an Israelite, and uh, and 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 we and we we kind of have to know the story, not necessarily chapter four, but whatever they knew about the story to understand this poem in general. And um, so she is praised. They are cursed. The the Kenites here are praised because of this woman. And again, that key motif in all of these, in both of these chapters, is the part that women play. Rabbi, yes. question. The fact that uh, the emphasis is on repeating words here, if in the original Hebrew, was this a form of, of a presentation to really make emphasis without any doubt? What was going well, on? Well, yeah, yeah, in general, right. The, it, we, we don't know if this was said at an annual celebration. Like some people, many, there's something called form, form criticism, biblical form criticism, that many of the Psalms, for instance, you've got some commentators that'll say, well, this Psalm was for a particular ceremony or a particular ritual. Um, and, and, but, but we do know, so we don't know if there was, if, if it was, there was a, a, an annual kind of a thing, a regular time, but we do know that it was or, this was oral, it was verbal, right? It was orally communicated, part of an oral tradition. We pretty much know that. And in all uh, oral traditions around the world, you have repetition in this kind of okay. thing. So what do you think you have in particular, though, that you want, you're asking of something, one particular thing? Right, because uh, 27 starts with, at her feet, he sank, laying outstretched. Again, at her feet, he sank, laying still. I okay, mean, good, that good is the perfect coupling right. that is what makes poetry breathe and just it, it's beautiful except for it doesn't do that on everything does it no. so your question would be why is it doing it here and here what, and not right and that's, because, a, that's a great go ahead and not and and not elsewhere at least we haven't seen yet so good eye because that that's a great segue into what we'll talk about i just want to before we'll get to that in a second, but just to set up the whole thing, she's blessed, right? And it's yes. emphasized she's a woman of tents. She's not a, she's she's a wandering shepherdess, right? She's a, a woman of tents, uh, moved from place to place. It's almost happenstance that she was able to see Sisra. Now we get to some of the details, right? He asked for water, she offered milk. Um, anybody have the other text in front of them from chapter four right now? 
Yes? No. Yeah. Okay, what, what verse? Um, I, I actually don't have it in front of me, but what, what did it say there? Um, uh, well, oh. when, she, when she killed him? Yeah. Before that, when he asked for milk, she gave him milk. She gave him milk and he, he had asked for water. Please let me have some water. I am thirsty. She opened a skim of milk and gave him some to drink and she covered him again. He said to her, stand at the entrance of the tent. If anybody comes and asks you if there's anybody here, say no. Okay, so we have the tent there, but here it's a little bit different. The, the tent doesn't, doesn't factor in in this particular part of the way it's described here. That doesn't mean all that much. The water, milk, that me, that's the same. The fact that it's the parallel of milk are curds, that's no big deal. You have those kind of parallels in them all the time. And it, we don't necessarily have to think of clear, you know, very liquidy milk as opposed to thick kind of uh, creamy milk, whatever it is, the same thing. But now we have some, some very, very intricate detail in poetic form. She reached with one, she reached with the left hand for the tent pin with the right for the hammer, because she's gonna have to do both, right? She's, she's working all this way. Doesn't say that, she, that he fell asleep, right? She, she, she crushed his head. Again, parallel, smashed and pierced his temple. That's all the same thing over and to emphasize it, right? How this is a pretty gory scene, but it's a noteworthy scene. But now comes the thing that Alan pointed out. What's this business with at her feet? And at her feet. Now, if you were to look in the Hebrew, you would see the, for at her feet in the Hebrew is ben ragleha, kara nafal shachar. So Ella, how would you translate ben ragleha? Um, between her feet, between, between her, her legs. legs, right? He fell down in two words be, and, and lay down, right, between her legs. Then it correct in the Hebrew, Ben Raglea, Karana fall again, as Alan said, it repeated it, and he fell down as he, as he was bent over, as he was bent over, that's where he fell down. And, and um, <laughs> That's, and that's where he was destroyed. So Alan, in answer to your question, my friend and teacher Yara Zakovich taught us here that this is a case in which the biblical text was made, was sensitized at some point. And that this reflects an older tradition of anybody, can anybody guess what it reflects? What would be the older tradition that somebody wanted to sensitize? Please, if you're not talking to with the group, please mute yourself. It, can anybody think of what, what would this, what would this be sensitizing, this particular description? Between her legs? Yes, John, go ahead. The translation I had says, between her legs, he kneeled. Then he fell and lay between her legs. He kneeled, he fell. Where he kneeled, he fell, destroyed. So falling and lying are in the same semantic field, yeah. right? So what could he be doing, folks? Could this be rape? Exactly. That's what Zakovich says. Zakovich claims here, and you know, again, I don't, I don't know how well it's accepted. This is how I learned the story first, probably almost the first time. And and this is a way, uh, it, it, what he calls idun hatex, the the sensitizing, the the making the the. Um, you know, there's th there are other examples of Ruvain and Bila. It doesn't say exactly that he that he, it doesn't go into details uh, or Jacob's, Jacob's reaction to that. There, there are a few stories, passages around the Hebrew Bible in which it feels like something is missing. And sometimes it talks about something in such a way that it's, um, it could easily be understood to be something that they didn't want to say out loud. Um, now, it, it, on the other hand, sometimes you have the same kind of language like the story of Ruth and Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor, where it, it feels like that too. And many commentators say, oh, well, they had sex, but the text just really wanted to clean it up a bit. So there actually Zakovich says, no, that's an example where they could have had sex, but they didn't. It would have been easy to have, but they didn't. But here, it's, it's according to Zakovich, this was an attempted rape. And that kind of makes sense. You know, you have stories of people who've been defeated, men, not people, men who have been defeated on the battlefield and then they, they go someplace and what do they do? And we have the horrible stories from wars across the centuries of how women were, were, were um, brutalized. 
because of men's frustrations with their with, with, with being defeated in battle. Any uh, comments? Yes, I have one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is quite proper to say, but it, it seems like there are a lot of sexual innuendos in the scriptures. In general, there is a lot, yeah, because it's, it's about life. And even though not all uh, cultures and civilizations want to talk about it out loud, people have been doing it forever, as we probably can surmise, right? So yeah, but this is one that most traditional commentators wouldn't go for. Uh, they just said, why would you bring, and, and reactions to Zakovich in the 80s, why would you bring that into the story? Well, well, we're gonna see why I think in two weeks from now when we look to some um, post-biblical pre-rabbinic commentary. Anybody else? Okay, so let's- Yeah, I think it makes more sense to me. Why a Kenite woman who uh, would would do that? Okay, so let let let. Uh, there seems to be one more uh, piece of information that might bolster Zakovich's interpretation. Uh, so, Sid, why don't you read twenty-eight to thirty? Through the window. After, wait, 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 so, where we are in the story is the war is over. The Israelites have defeated the enemy. Um, Sisra himself has been defeated by a mere shepherd woman. And now we go, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Go ahead. Through the window peered Cicero's mother. Behind the lattice, she whined. Why is his chariot so, so long in coming? Why so late the clatter of his wheels? The wisest of her ladies give answer. She too replies to herself. They must be dividing the spoil to have found a damsel or two for each man, spoil of dyed cloth for Sisera, spoil of em embroidered cloths, a couple of embroidered cloths round every neck as spoil. So, and yet another woman enters the story who we didn't hear about from beforehand, Sisera's mother, Aim Sisera. She's Sisera's mother, okay? And so she's looking, and it's, it's, it's a forlorn scene here, right? She's at the window looking, when's my son going to come? When will I get my gifts? When will I get the fancy embroidery that, that he's stolen from the corpses and pulled off the corpses of the Israelites? I'm adding on a little bit of embellishment, of course. <laughs> and then, when she, well, why hasn't he come home yet? Because meanwhile, he's lying in a pool of blood with his head smashed in. So th there's a lot of irony here. There's a lot of, uh, this is how... Um, in literature, enemies are dealt with very often. Who knows if it was historically true or not? But, uh, but then we get this little tidbit here, Sid, that seems like it supports Zakovich's understanding. Aside from the yeah. embroidered cloth is, you know, well, of course, maybe, maybe he got tied a, up a raping, raping a damsel or two. I mean, that's what it is, right? A damsel or two for each man. Maybe they got, they got preoccupied with their raping. I'm sorry to be so verbal about this, but I, it, to me, it seems like this is that's what this story is about. This, this is what this is the feature of this story. That's what this part is about. So you've got the Israelites who are able to defeat because of the ones who are dedicated and praise God, and then you have this one enemy, the, what's one representative of the enemy who look at him. You know, he's he, he he's he's raping women. Right, instead of praying to God. I think that's kind of the feeling here. And Sue Spicer, you want to read the last bit for us, please? So may all your enemies perish, O Lord, but may his friends be as the sun rising in might. And the land was tranquil for, for tranquil 40 years. Okay, so that last part, tranquil 40 years, is part of that editorial comments that we're used to now, right? And, um, and, so that, and that, boys and girls, says the poet here, is the lesson for today, that this is the way that the enemies will perish and the good people, they'll get theirs. And so um, a, a, difficult, a difficult chapter because the language is difficult, po poetry is difficult. Yes, Rita Claire. Um, could this be why uh, they changed that um, uh, children from uh, mothers would be would be considered Jewish because of the rape? 
that's what people say. Of course, there was, but the, the, the thing with that, Rita Claire, is that there was rape, there's probably as much rape today as there was then, the then being the medieval period when that, that law was changed as far as, uh, or late antiquity when the law of patrilineal descent was changed to matrilineal descent. But in the Bible, they were raping people as well. So I know that's the that's what people say, but I'm not sure that's that that it's so easy, because in biblical times, right? In biblical times, you went by your father, you didn't go by your mother. Yes, I know so, that. And, and yet, women were still being raped then. Well, oh, I yeah. just maybe it was more of a of a protection for the for the offspring, so that they would would feel a part of the the uh, community. They wouldn't be outcasts. Like, for example, in 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 um, in a, some Asian lands, um, like when during the war, when the Americans were in the like Vietnam and so forth, uh, and and the women were either raped or they had consensual intercourse, and a and a child came from that union, that they were outcasts. That they, they were considered. Outcasts. They weren't. They weren't. Um, it, it's a shame, but that's what how they they were. They considered them. So, Rita, I, what I think is that that's been the case all over the world forever. Yeah. Right. So, I I think that is the case because um, that's part of war. I don't think this this chapter addresses that particular issue. It yeah. does. It, it does show that. It, 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 and I would like to think that the Israelite soldiers were. Um, were encouraged not to rape, and although there's, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure we had it as much as everybody else, uh, and that the offspring, who, you know, it, it doesn't relate to. But the, the fact of the matter is, in biblical times, the child, the offspring, went after his father, whoever that might be. Maybe that was more humanitarian, but at some point in late antiquity, onwards, at least in our tradition, it moved to the mother. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's to, and that's for the reason that people give, which I'm saying I don't think I'm not necessarily sure it's correct. But the people give, uh, as you surmise, is because uh, you always know the mothers, you don't know who the father is. Okay. I mean, just imagine me to declare a, a Jewish kid, who um, you know people knew about his that that his mother was raped. You know they know about it. They know that the child the child came from from that particular. It doesn't really help. That he's considered Jewish. Anyway, a complicated matter, but probably for another time. Anything okay. else before we uh, we close up for today? How are you getting to the airport? Oh, it's a complicated day. I have a, I have a I have a funeral at um, at twelve noon, so I'm not sure yet when I need to get back here. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll let if if that's an offer to take me, then I'll I'll give yes. you a call. And, okay. Okay, that's, that's an good. offer. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so everybody, just to go back, that on, um, we'll have class uh, on Wednesday. Wait a minute. Do we have time that Wednesday morning? Yes, I think we can do class. And this Wednesday already, the class will be coming Wednesday, will be at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and Thursdays continue to be at 11 o'clock, but it won't be next Thursday. Okay. And this Friday night and Saturday is at uh, Whitewater, or we're, um, not Whitewater, but Idlewild. Idlewild. Six o'clock and nine thirty. This right. Saturday. Saturday. Okay. Saturday. All right, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. everybody. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye-bye.